guys, it's Jenny. And this is Alexa. And we're back with another edition of Checked Out. Uh, today's episode is all about the best of 2017. And we're really excited because today our special guest is Becca Montano-Smith, the assistant manager of the Eastside branch. And <laughs> Becca is kind of our library systems, um, I don't know, what you call her, expert? Like a reader's advisory guru. Yeah, basically. <laughs> guru. <laughs> Becca, you're I'll a guru. <laughs> so welcome, Becca. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes. So we're going to run down uh, some of our favorites from 2017, fiction, nonfiction, and even some of uh, children and YA selections. Uh, we, we're kind of a, a great mix here because Alexa's a pretty avid reader. Um, I would love to read more than I do, but I've got two small people at home, <laughs> and so uh, we do a lot of uh, picture book reading. Uh, and then Becca is, as we mentioned before, the guru. So. <laughs> All right, so let's jump right in. Alexa, do you want to get us started with your top fiction picks? Yeah. Um, so my number one fiction fiction book that I read this year was phenomenal. I read at the very beginning of the year, blew me out of the water, didn't really find anything that topped it throughout the whole year. Um, it was Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders. Um, it is really intense and really weird. If you've ever read anything by George Saunders, he's, he's a little out there. Um, but it's basically, it is um, Lincoln in the cemetery after his son Willie dies. Um, and it's basically like Abraham Lincoln in purgatory, but it's told from the point of view of the ghosts that are in the cemetery and that are trying to get Willie like and help him move on. Um, and it's wonder. I'm like a huge Abraham Lincoln nerd. Like he's always been my favorite president. I'm really into Abraham Lincoln. Um, and it's just it was so beautiful. And the writing in it is really bizarre. It's told in like ghost dialect almost. Um, like like I don't know how. It's kind of like. When you read the dialect in like old Southern novels, like mm -hmm. how they write it out phonetically, um, the ghosts all talk in kind of the dialect from the era that they died in. Okay, it's makes sense. really amazing. It's super creative. Neil Gaiman kind of does that to an extent in Graveyard Book. He does, yeah. I mean, and that's a book for children. So yeah, he, he tones it down, but still, yeah, yeah. It's a similar kind of idea. Yeah, with the ghouls and their kind of like Cockney accents mm -hmm. that they do. Yeah, um, and it's it's wonderful. Um, I, have you did either of you read? Like, I didn't, no, would, I would recommend it for anyone. Um, like I said, it is kind of out there. Um, it's very like high literary kind of a little it takes a little bit, bit to get into it um, but it's so worth it it is very it is extremely moving really really wonderful book um, even if you're not a Lincoln nerd like me <laughs> <laughs> um, but my other big fiction pick um, I, I was mentioning before we started the podcast I've read so much romance this year a lot of romance novels um, and I actually discovered Tessa Dare at the beginning of the year, read through every single book that Tessa Dare wrote, and then she had a new novel that came out um, this fall. It was called The Duchess Deal. Um, it was really wonderful. It was the start of a new series that she's writing. So if you want to get into Tessa Dare, this is a really good starting point because it's the first book in a new series. Um, and it's kind of a, a Beauty and the Beast mm -hmm. retelling, basically. Um, it's... Uh, this woman has created, she's a seamstress, and she's created this really elaborate wedding dress. And then the woman that she made the wedding dress for bails. She bails on the wedding. And so she puts on this wedding dress, the seamstress says, she puts on this huge, beautiful dress that she made. And she, like, storms down to this duke's house. And she's just like, I just want payment for this. I, put, I spent all this time making this wedding dress. And the duke's like, well, let's just get married. And because he... He's the one who got run out on, and he needs to produce an heir. And typical romance novel, marriage of convenience trope. Really wonderful, super delightful. Tessa Dare, if you've never read her, she's very witty. Um, her characters are very, like, kind of, like, self-referential. Mm -hmm. um, she, she puts a lot of really fun nods. She's had Hamilton references in her books before. Um, a, a mother tells her daughter at one point in one of her more recent books um, to talk less and smile more, which is very funny. Um, so she she knows she's writing romance novels and yeah. she's like she does a lot of winking. Um, so it's really really sweet. It was a great book. Yeah, she's a cut above for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And you read the Duchess Deal, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's not on my list, but um, it is. It was one of the best ones of the year. Yeah. It's been on a lot of other romance reader best lists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it was on NPR's one. list this year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was really good. I don't read a lot of romance, but Alexa, you've gotten me to appreciate the genre. Yeah, lot. it's fun. Yeah, it is fun. It's it's like. Fun light read. It, it's fun. It's light. Like you know what you're getting. It's I, I find it very comforting to pick up a romance novel. Mm -hmm. I read because, a lot of cozy mysteries for the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's like you know what you're getting. Like even if somebody does something different, like Tessa Dare tends to do, it's like you still. It's it's comforting to know where everybody's going to end up. <laughs> like you you know I, where it's going. I think that's one of the um, attractions. Or yeah, the, one of the attractions of genre 
reading mm-hmm. it, what it's science fiction, fantasy, a lot of times it's certainly romance, um, is that you kind of know what you're getting into. Um, and so if you like the setup, then then you already know sort of the skeleton of the story. You got the familiar um, beats. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that. Like when you're mm-hmm. looking for comfort, for you know, comfort reading, um, literary reading or uh, you know other kinds of fiction, you never know what you're going to get into. And who knows what you're going to, you know, how it's going to go or how it's going to end up. And, you know, it might be a great story and then everybody dies at the end. And, you know, that's a great, you know, I might win you some awards, but, you know, readers are devastated. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's not what's going to happen in a romance novel. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, there's a lot of, um, that's one of the main attractions, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you have some favorite romances this year? Um, I did, actually. Um, overall, like I said, um, there were two that really stood out. I have, I have more, but um, Extraordinary Union by Alyssa Cole. She's a relatively um, new writer. She's a black writer. Um, and this is a story of a, uh, a young woman. Um, she's black. She's, um, she's free, and she lives in the North. Um, but she has a photographic memory. And so um, she has been um, touring around... Um, I can say vaudeville, but you know, speaking engagements and, and doing public appearances in support of um, the abolitionist movement. Um, and then um, she gets involved in the Union cause, and she is sent to the South to masquerade as a slave um, in a... Um, I'm going to forget who the, the guy is, but he's somebody in the Confederacy um, uh, to gather information. So she's in an incredibly dangerous position, um, and she meets a, um, a white man who is... Um, he's a Pinkerton agent, and so he's there under the pretext that he is a Confederate officer. Um, and so they discover each other quickly, and they discover, like, he's her contact, and they're supposed to be working together, and they're in an incredibly perilous position. And as far as the romance tropes, you just don't see how this is going to work out. It's mm-hmm. 1864 or something like that, and we all know what happens, but it's like, how in the world is re- this relationship going to end up in the standard happily ever after? You Did know, they move to Canada? <laughs> it's just like, well, right. it so, has to so be something like that. that. That's the thing. You're like, maybe they moved to Europe. It's like, you know, it's still yeah. going to be an easy go, but like at least they could legally be together. Like, how is this all going to work out? Um, and so I think that's one of the extraordinary things is that in a lot of romances, like you, it's you, absolutely a foregone conclusion. And so you're just waiting to see how it gets there. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this case, it sticks to, you know, the basic... Um, plot, but you just, you absolutely cannot see how this is going to work out. Um, But the characters are great, they're super smart, and this is not a time period that really lends itself to romance. You know, it's not like the Regency era where, you know, everything was parties and, you know, and Johnson the Park and, you know, these elaborate courtship rituals. This is like war and life and death, and they're on this razor's edge where, you know, who knows what's going to happen in every second, you know, like they might be revealed and, you know, killed in some horrible way. And you're like, this doesn't sound super romantic, <laughs> yeah. but um, it really works. And Alyssa Cole, I think, is a name to watch. She's got another book um, that is coming out, um, but that's a fantastic one. Um, and then my other one um, is called Ruin of a Rake, and it's by Cat Sebastian. And this is actually a male-male um, romance, and this was the first year I think I've read any of those? I read a few, and this one really stands out. Um, and now, of course, I'm blanking on the plot, but it's a standard. It's a Regency romance. It takes place in Europe, and it's, um, and um, for like I said, it's it's really interesting um, the development in the past. I don't know, five to ten years of um, gay and lesbian romances that follow the standard romance tropes. Um, and Cat Sebastian is again. She's another name to watch. She's come up. Um, she's got a couple more um, coming out. So I like those. Nice. Mm-hmm. I don't really have any romance on my list except for um, I guess you might consider it a romance, but Love and Other Consolation Prizes by uh, Jimmy Ford, which we've already talked about on the podcast, but which I really enjoyed. Um, I think he he suffers from the same. Uh, problem that some authors do, other authors do, where they've sort of like prettified the book covers mm. and make you think you might be reading one thing, and then mm. you actually get into it and you're like, oh, there's more here to this. There's more substance. Uh, mm. And so he he delves into race and class and um, a whole bunch of of darker, deeper things. But there's also a very lovely uh, romance throughout. So yeah, I rec- I highly recommend uh, Love and Other Consolation Prizes. Uh, what else do we love in fiction this year? Um, well, my top graphic novel by Red. I read a lot of manga, a lot of graphic novels this year. Um, Saga Volume 7 came out. Um, you might know of Saga if you listen to our Brian K. Vaughn episode that we did of the podcast. Um, 
It is an ongoing series. It is the most intense space opera ever written. It's so good. Um, it, it's the story of um, two kind of star-crossed lovers. Um, Marco and Alana are two different races. Um, Marco is from the moon that orbits Alana's planet, and they are at war. Um, and they are in opposing armies, and they meet each other when Marco is a prisoner in um, Alana's camp that she's working at, and they fall in love. Um, and they get married, and the, the series starts with them having their child. Mm, okay. And so all of these different people are after them, trying to get their daughter Hazel because she's not supposed to exist, because they're supposed to hate each other. Extremely fraught, really beautiful. Fiona Staples is the artist. Um, her artwork is absolutely breathtaking. She just some of the most beautiful artwork in any graphic novel I've ever read. So pretty. Um, but yeah, Volume 7 came out this year, and it was... It was really intense. When I say that, it's very fraught. Um, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, it's really, really intense. Um, volume 7, I had to kind of put down after I read it, like take a breath, like kind of absorb what I read. It's Emotionally a, recover? I had to really recover afterwards. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really dark one, um, but it's really good. They did a time skip, so Hazel's, Hazel's a little bit older now, um, so you're kind of getting... Like five, five to five or six year old Hazel now. Um, so there, there are kind of more problems where, where that comes in. Um, but it's really just kind of the journey of this little family as they fly through space in their treehouse spaceship, um, which <laughs> there's a reason behind that. Um, sure. It's really, really wonderful. I always recommend Saga to people, um, even if you're not a graphic novel reader. Um, Saga, Brian K. Vaughn, the, the way that he writes graphic novels, um, you, you can really get something out of it, even if you don't typically read comic books. Um, his stories are just amazing. Um, Why the Last Man is another of his series that is completed now, and it's wonderful, really, really great. Highly recommend Brian K. Vaughn to anyone if you're interested in getting into graphic novels, don't really know where to start. Um, Saga is only seven volumes in, um, and he he's really good about actually having endpoints for his graphic novels. I know a lot of people are kind of hesitant to get into him. It's not all like Superman, Spider-Man, where it's never you ended. don't know where to start and it's never going to end. <laughs> um, Brian K. Vaughn tells stories, um, and they, they do end at a point, and you will have a conclusion. Um, so that's a really good thing about his stuff. My favorite graphic novel of this year, and actually the only one that I, I, I read this year, I don't typically read a lot of graphic novels, but Brian recommended this on an earlier podcast, and that is uh, My Favorite Thing is Monsters by Emile Ferris, which is going to be a three-volume set um, about a girl growing up in the 60s. She kind of feels like an outcast. Her older brother teaches her how to draw. Uh, she draws herself as like a werewolf, <laughs> like a werewolf girl, kind of a loner, and her upstairs neighbor, who is a Holocaust survivor, is murdered. And so she's trying to figure out and solve the murder and also kind of come to terms with some things about herself. Um, random side note about the author, Emile Ferris actually was bitten by a mosquito and got West Nile virus Jeez. and was paralyzed from like the waist down and her drawing hand was par briefly paralyzed. <laughs> oh my God. And so she had to reteach herself how to draw Jeez, and that's how she, she got involved after that um, in graphic novels. That's so, really fascinating. Right? <laughs> I didn't know that part. Um, I, I haven't read the book, but I know it's it's on a lot of year end lists um, as as best of in the genre this year. So yeah, um, and Brian said it was amazing. It's very it's really good. It's it's a little bit of everything. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of a coming of age story, but there's this mystery there, and um, it has an older brother who's trying not to get drafted to Vietnam. There's a lot there, so it's it's really fascinating. Mm. That's really cool. Okay, um, so for Out of the Ordinary, I, this year I was really looking for some for things that were just different. I felt like I'd seen everything and done everything. So um, I um, read City of Brass by S.A. Uh, Chakraborty, and it is a fantasy title, um, but it is completely different from most fantasy titles, especially anything that I've read recently. It, it takes place in 18th century Cairo. Um, so right there, it's not the, you know, proto-European um, fantasy land that we all know. Um, and the protagonist is a young girl. She's, well, a young woman. She's about 20. She's completely on her own. She doesn't have any family. Um, and she makes her living as sort of this, um, a con artist, basically. Um, and she, um, you know, acts sort of uh, as a faith healer, if you will. Um, but she actually has healing powers. Like, she can tell what's wrong with people, and she actually can affect some some healing. Um, and then one day, by accident, um, singing a song that she remembers from the dim recesses of her childhood, she actually <laughs> calls forth an ancient genie. And he's somewhat upset to be called forth, and he's like, what's going on? And so the next thing you know, he's whisked her away, and they are um, literally flying across 
um, the Middle East, um, and they land in this um, city, the city of Brass, um, where she discovers that she is part of an ancient race of um, healers, and it's all, it, like you were talking about the the saga. Um, so it's all these different factions, mm-hmm. and there's all these rules that she had no idea about, and she has all these powers, and um, some people um, see her coming as fortuitous, and and like she might rescue them, and other people are really upset that <laughs> she has shown her face, um, and um, so it's a lot of political and, and um, palace intrigue and magic and, like I said, factions and wars and um, like I said powers that she didn't know anything about, and it's just fantastic, and it's the start of a series. Um, but, I mean, it's just a, um, a dive into a world and a mythological tradition that we just, we don't hear a whole lot about, especially, like, we might hear, like, genies, like, in sort of a superficial, you know, picture book kind of way, but not in a thoroughly explored um, adult novel. And so it was really fun. Nice. City Brass. My favorite book, my favorite fiction book of 2017 was Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz uh, to, to switch genres a little bit and dive into mystery. Um, it is sort of like, it, it's, a, it's a book within a book um, and it's sort of like an Agatha Christie book wrapped in a Robert Galbraith book, hmm. uh, which is J.K. Rowling's uh, pseudonym for the mystery, the adult mystery novel she writes. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, it's, it's brilliantly done and the the book within the book that's sort of an Agatha Christie base. I mean, it it, it could it could he could e- easily put himself up there. Um, that as, that as could a be writer. a standalone. Like, really. It could be a standalone. Yeah, yeah. and he puts himself up there as the writing style very similar to Christie's. Hmm. And actually, my fifteen minutes of Twitter fame, I tweeted at him um, <laughs> and said like, Matt, or I tweeted, I included him in a tweet. So like, Magpie Murders is the best of twenty seventeen. You know, Horowitz is the heir to the Christie throne. And he uh, tweeted back at me, "How oh, kind of you, thank you." Oh. And so I felt <laughs> super famous for a super whole funny. day. Yeah. Um, but if you like mysteries, I highly recommend it. He is also uh, was the writer on Foil's War and some other uh, mystery shows for the BBC. He wrote a little bit for Midsummer Murders. So if you like that type of very, you know, quintessential English mis- murder mystery. He's your guy. Um, but definitely, definitely Magpie Murders. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I don't read a lot of mystery, but I, I've heard really good things about that it's one. It's great. It's yeah. really, really great. Um, so for mysteries, I've got two completely um, opposing directions. Um, so I read a couple of um, series that um, they're both Victorian, um, and both of them are women protagonists who don't... Um, play by the rules um, and one is uh, Sherry Thomas um, she does she's doing a new one um, and it's basically um, Lady Sherlock it's Sherlock retold um, if Sherlock was a woman oh. okay our children's li- children's librarian at Beaumont actually called me this morning and left me a vote <laughs> mail and said I just read this book about a Lady Sherlock and you've got to read it it made me think of you <laughs> <laughs> well, Lady it, Sherlock it, it's fantastic and so um, the second the first one came out last year and the second one is called um, Conspiracy in Belgravia and it is fantastic I think this one might even be stronger than the first one just because they're developing the, the character um, her name is actually Charlotte and she goes by Sherlock because she knows she she, she knows that she's not going to get anywhere um, as a woman, and so she fronts, she pretends, she essentially creates Sherlock as a front, and she and her um, her sister and then some uh, a cadre of, of friends and helpers um, sort of create this illusion that Sherlock is an old sick guy, and she's his sister, and so she's sort of his public face, and so that's who the clients deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, so like, there's all, you know, this is the second one, and there's always a mystery, but the real story is her and how she gets along, because she has no interest in um, the traditional um, role of a woman, which is marriage and children. She's she's not, I don't think they're aristocracy. They're definitely gentry, though. So they're well-off, you know, upper-middle-class people. Um, and she has no interest in that. And so she takes steps to ensure that that will not be her fate. Um, and she is 100% upfront about it. And there have been some reviews that have said that um, she's autistic or has, you know, is on the spectrum or something. And, I mean, that could be argued, but mostly she just... People think that about Sherlock, though. Right, and so it, she exhibits the same kinds of like all the different p- characteristics. It's just that it's a woman, and so it's it's even less acceptable. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, and so yeah, so she is she is one hundred percent upfront with people, and um, but she under she understands social conventions. She just is not bound by them at all. So mm. she does what she has to do to get by and stay within the bounds of respectability. But she takes it all the way to the edge, <laughs> and so and and so she does what she has to do um, to ensure that she can move around and, and do what she 
um, has to do to solve mysteries and live her life without being constrained by the rules of the day. And um, it's pretty great. Those are somewhat, I'm not going to say, it's, they're not super dark, but they're definitely serious. Um, and there's another series by um, Deanna Rayborn, um, and the most recent one came out. It's called The Perilous Undertaking. And it's the same thing. This is a woman um, who's a, um, I can never say it, a butterfly catcher. She, she studies and catches butterflies. And so oh. she's traveled all over the world um, uh, chasing butterflies um, and gathering um, butterfly uh, specimens. But she um, was raised by some elderly women who were not related to her, but just sort of took care of her. Um, and so her backgrounds are sort of um, vague and unknown. And she does the same thing. She decided early on that she was not going to do the marriage um, and kid thing, and she wanted to be a scientist and travel all over the world, and so she has. And so she has affairs with men, but never in England, because she knows that, again, she has to stay within the bounds of respectability. And so she feels like she can live her life outside um, of the of the UK, basically. Um, and hers are really witty, and there's like a lot of banter, and it's really fun, and it's qu- kind of like the old style um, you know, Cary Grant and, you know, Doris Day, you know, where they trade quips back and forth and she has a, a, a partner with her and they solve mysteries, they go around solving mysteries. And so um, it's it's really fun. And it, there's a lot of um, the explorer, gentleman scientist um, kind of life going on. Um, but those are really, really fun. And then I will peg another one. Um, Joe Ide wrote... Um, IQ last year, and it was a um, the first installment in his series, and it is a modern day Sherlock. <laughs> Except this <laughs> that's guy, that's a big one. That, yeah. I remember that was everywhere last mm-hmm. year. It, it's fantastic, um, and uh, I I pick up almost any book about California in the first place just because I'm from there. But um, I picked this one up, and it's supposed to be a modern day Sherlock, and it's this boy. He's a he's a genius, um, but he's he's a black kid from uh, Long Beach. And um, his brother was killed, and so he had been sort of on track to go to college, and then um, they don't have parents, and so he's sort of left on his own. And so he gets kind of stuck. And so what he ends up doing is, because he's so smart, he ends up um, helping his friends and neighbors um, and people in the community solve murders or solve, solve crimes um, and, and different mysteries, um, and they pay him with whatever they can. So sometimes it's a chicken, and sometimes it's blueberry muffins, and very rarely is it cash, and so he kind of has to hustle to get by. Um, and so this is the second installment, and it's called Righteous. Um, and I'm really looking forward to more um, development, because in this one he he dis- he tries to solve um, his brother's um, death, because it looks like an accident, and he's trying to figure out if it really was. There's a hit and run, and the police don't care. Um, but yeah, so Sherlock is a is a trope that apparently is just it's a well that just keeps on going. Yeah, I mean everyone's like you can say modern Sherlock, women Sherlock. It all works. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, someone's gonna read it. It's yeah, yeah. like literally that that book is for for someone out there. They they will always flock to the the Sherlock term. I think just the idea that there's somebody that's smart enough to figure out these mysteries that we know that we probably would never have the skills or mm-hmm. the resources at the time to unravel and like the idea that somebody would help you <laughs> yeah so satisfying. yeah yeah I was, like I was saying I don't read a lot of mysteries but it's just like anytime I do I was just like how do people even write this it's just like <laughs> the, yeah they put the plot together yeah, and get all the clues and stuff yeah I don't know a really well written mystery it has so many different like puzzle pieces that fit so perfectly together and I'm just like I'm always in awe anytime I read them I'm just I don't understand yeah. how people are able to put those things together have either of you read the um Miss Cop series. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> those are fantastic. Her third one came them. out this year, um, Miss Cop's Midnight Confessions. Mm-hmm. But prior to that are uh, Lady Cop Makes Trouble, which is mm-hmm. hilarious. That's the second girl, one. Girl, girl Waits with Gun is the first one. And it's, yeah. it's based, based on, on true, true Story. She yeah. was the first. Amy like, Stewart, right? Yes, Amy yeah. Stewart. Yeah. She was the, uh, the girl in the book. Can't, uh, Constance Cop was like the first uh, female sheriff's deputy, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in America, it was like 1914, and so it's about her and her sisters, and really really fun and very different. If you if you like to read the Victorian England Sherlock mm-hmm. take off, and you want kind of a you want something similar, but maybe with a different kind of setting, uh, this one's great. It was fantastic, and it's not a, a time period that I would normally be drawn to. Right. Um, but I kept reading reviews about it, and I was like, all right, fine, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it, because I was not a big mystery reader, mm-hmm. actually, until just relatively recently. Um, but so funny, and so dry, and so, so droll. Yes, yeah. and, 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 and sort of end of end of the Gilded Age, but they're mm-hmm. not they not living in... In Gilded Age, you know, New York or anything like that, it's it's rural. Uh, New Jersey. Yeah, rural New Jersey. So. But again, it's it's three women, the two older sisters particularly, mm-hmm. who are determined to live life on their own, like their own um, 
yeah, on their own. Like they they just are going to do that. Um, and uh, they could move into the, with their brother, their married brother, and his family. Um, and they are somewhat encouraged to do that, and they refuse, and they're like, nope, we're just going to keep toughing it out here in the country, you know. Yeah, in the first book, they're in a wagon accident, and the person who hits them, uh, they're in a wagon, and a car hits them, and the person driving the car is, like, a notorious um, like factory owner, but mobster, kind of, at the same time, and uh, the brother says, you know, okay, now, it's been, it's been, you know, you've had fun playing house on your own for a little while, but now it's time to come move in with me, and so they sort of get desperate to... Um, to support themselves. To support themselves, and mm-hmm. they, they want to get the wagon fixed, and they, that's how it starts. They want, they go after this guy to get the money to fix it. Specifically, their... the oldest sister does. Um, it's yes. Constance who does it, because she's got, her, the other sister is obsessed with her carrier pigeons, and really <laughs> wants nothing to do with people. As one is. <laughs> as, as, one, <laughs> right? as one does. Sure. Uh, wants nothing to do with people, really, at all. Mm-hmm. Her, her pigeons are really sufficient for her. And the youngest sister is still a teenager, and they are trying to protect her and kind of keep her, like, in school and right. uh, potentially launch her into life it's in some regard. And so she can't really affect anything so it's really up to this older sister Constance to to save the family to, to save to preserve their independence and, and and so she does it she she wrangles basically she strong arms the sheriff into giving her a job um, and then she sets about to do it when nobody is really on her side um, and you learn a lot about the law yeah in New Jersey and specifically America um, in that time and and how women were up against it um, and um, all of the stuff that she has to go through. It's very well researched because Amy mm-hmm. Stewart's previous uh, work was in, was in nonfiction. Mm-hmm. She wrote The Wicked Botanist and some others. Oh, I've heard of those. And yeah. she actually she yeah. was in touch with the actual family descendants of uh-huh. these people, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, and got isn't got their permission, you know, because she's fictionalized obviously a lot of it, but it, it is based on real things that she did, real cases, and the wagon incident was real, huh. um, and all that. And so so that gives it a flavor that that you know when you're reading this and you're like, oh ha ha, and like no no no, like that really happened. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that was that's a real. Yeah, I need to finally pick these books up. I actually had a customer on the phone the other day, and she was asking me to put one on hold, and she was like, "Have you not read them?" I was like, <laughs> "You have to read them." So it's like everyone's telling me to read these books, and I just haven't gotten around to that, it. That's yet, what, that's I finally what need to. I just like there was there were people who had read it, and it kept getting checked out. It kept passing through my yeah. hands at the branch, and then I kept reading um, the reviews about it, and finally I was like, "Okay, fine, yeah, fine, I'll read it." And I was like, "Oh, this is so fun!" I need to. So, I yeah, need to. I've been meaning to. <laughs> Highly recommend. And I actually have the first one in ARC format you can borrow. Oh, nice. <laughs> I would like that. <laughs> um, to kind of piggyback off of the, the mystery uh, thing, I'm going to jump into YA a little bit, if that's sure. okay with everyone. Sure. And plug Turtles All the Way Down, which is John Green's newest book. John Green. Um, oh, it's his first book since The Fault in Our Stars came out, so it's been a little while. It's been like oh. six years. Um, and I was really, really, I'm a huge John Green fan. Watch the Lug Brothers. Watch all of his YouTube stuff. Project for Awesome's going on. That's super cool. Um, keep up with John Green pretty regularly. Um, so I was really, really excited for, for his new book. Um, and it did not disappoint. I honestly thought it's it's my favorite book that he's written. Um, and I really, really like Looking for Alaska. So that's saying something. That it's I, I think it's better than Looking for Alaska. Um, it is about a high school girl, and she has severe OCD. Um, she's, and John Green does a wonderful job of portraying this well, He this himself girl. suffers from OCD. He does, yeah, he, oh, he, yeah. he, he does. Um, so he does a really, really good job um, getting into her head and kind of um, putting down on paper her, her thought patterns and her spirals, her, her thought spirals, as she calls them, um, and, and kind of gets into her head. Um, and it's about uh, the local billionaire who lives in uh, Indi- Indianapolis uh, goes missing. Um, and it turns out that the the son of the local billionaire, um, she used to go to to sad kid camp with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what she calls it. Um, both of their both of them had parent. His mother died and her father died. So they went to sad kid camp together when they were little. And her best friend is like, well, there's a reward out for this missing billionaire because he he ran off with all and he's like wanted for like embezzlement and all this oh. stuff. And so she's like, well, you've got this link. We can go talk to his son and see if. We can find him and get the reward. Um, and so uh, they, they kind of try and worm their way back into, into her, her sad camp kid friend's life. Um, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's such a like good a more grown-up Westing game. Kind of, yeah. So are they they're supposed to be teenagers? <laughs> they're teenagers, okay. yeah. Yeah, they're in high school. Um, and I thought that John did a really, really good job of um, kind of illustrating differences in... in um, like the differences in families, money that comes in. Um, the mm-hmm. protagonist um, is pretty well off. Like she doesn't have to worry about a job. She's got her dad's car. She doesn't have to worry about transportation. She, her best friend works at Chuck E. Cheese's. Um, she doesn't have a car. She relies on her friend for transportation. So 
this reward money would be a big deal for her friend. She's mm-hmm. really like that would help. That would help her go to college. Um, she doesn't have to, and the main character doesn't really have to think about that stuff. And so he does a really good job um, kind of portraying the differences in in kids and the family's income. Really kind of colors how you grow up as a high schooler. Uh, he also, I, I will say, I have not read it all yet, but I have I have skimmed it numerous times as I've seen it come through the library it's and. Wonderful. I, I also have OCD. I was diagnosed in high school, and I had a pretty severe case of it in high school. Um, it's, and it's something that you kind of have your whole life. But reading her, reading how he, he writes it, I mean, spot on. Yeah. 100% spot on. It's yeah. just absolutely wonderful for, I think, any teenager who's struggling with any kind of, um, you know, be it depression, anxiety, OCD, whatever. I think just having someone say, I hear you, I understand what it's like, you can still have... He was a life. life. And he does it he does it so so compassionately. Absolutely. And I think that was one of the things that really resonated with people about the fault in our stars too, is that he he's not just like rubbernecking on like horrible experiences for teenage kids. Like he he's He's trying to come at it um, in a way where he illustrates that he under, he understands. I mean, he wrote The Fault in Our Stars, and he had this friendship with with a terminally ill cancer patient who was a teenager. Um, and, and he talked about the book with her and mm. kind of got her input. And so he really does try and empathize with his characters. Yeah, um, he had planned to be uh, a chaplain. He actually had planned to be, I think, an Episcopal priest. Yeah, right? he's a religion major. <laughs> and when he was, he was kind of like in his, I guess, doing an internship um, as with a, a chaplain at a hospital, and that's how he met the girl and, and uh, friendship developed and all of that. So that's, he, that's where Fault in Our Stars comes from. He, he Yeah, he that was whenever he decided he couldn't be a chaplain, was Absolutely. when he did his internship at a hospital with terminally ill kids, and he was like, nope, not for me, can't do it. I, um, I just remember I, I read that entire book, uh, I had a <clears throat> flight delay in Philadelphia, and I read that entire book sitting at an airport bar, just ugly, crying. It's <laughs> yes. brutal. And the waitress was real surprised when she turned around and she asked if I wanted another drink, and I was like, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but I had a teacher approach me while I was reading because, you know, I had it propped up, and he came and he said, oh, I've heard about that book. Is it good? And I was like, it's fantastic. I was like... You know, and he's like, I want to get my kids to read it. I was like, well, there's two kids with cancer, so I don't know, like, like, it's either going to be a great book or not the great book. He said that he had two kids with cancer in his class at that moment, and I was like... Like maybe it, not this one. I was like, I don't know. It's either the best or the worst. Maybe it's yeah. optional. I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's what I remember. <laughs> yeah. Plug for Esther Earl, by the way. That is the, the name of the girl that he was friends with. She has her own book. We have it at the library. It's called The Star Will Not Go Out. So she survived. She, no. 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 It's her journals and her parents kind of completed it. Sorry. Oh. Um, but it's a lovely, it's a really lovely book. Uh, um, Alexa has a thing for Downer books. I'm sorry. We'll talk about that in, when we get to nonfiction. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, no. Um, the Turtles All the Way Down is really, really good. Um, highly recommend it. Uh, like Jenny said, it's it's very empathetic portrayal of a, a young girl with um, OCD. Um, and another thing that I really love about John Green books, um, especially since he's become a father, is he really... You don't see a lot of YA books. I think it's more common now, but the parents are are so sympathetic in the books. Um, the main character's mother is is a really like three dimensional character. She's really wonderful. I mean, she's got her flaws, but not completely checked out. Like exactly, yeah. like, like uh, what Nancy and, and Mike's parents. Oh my god, yeah, Stranger 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 <laughs> the worst oh parents ever. ever. <laughs> no, Mike's, yeah, Mike's dad is the worst. <laughs> I really want him to get eaten by a monster in season. <laughs> if I if I get nothing else in season three, I want Mike's dad to get eaten. By I a want monster. him just yeah. to see a monster to kind of like wake him up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even think that would do it. I think he would think he had heartburn and he'd like go back to bed. He'd be like, "Oh, right, you're you're probably right." One of my favorite writers, Drew McGarry. He does. He did a list this year of like the most ineffective people of 2017, and the dad, Mike's dad. dad. (laughs) He's like, he's my hero. He's the kind of guy who like his wife looks at him after his kids get like they run away with monsters, and he's just like, "Well, what? Like, what did I do?" Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's the worst. It, it, yeah, we're getting off topic for a second. But but my one TV, if you watch nothing else from 2017, watch Stranger Things. Yeah, it's so fantastic and uh, fun and funny and also really deep. And uh, there's just so much to it. And the kids are phenomenal. I can't even imagine being that talented at that age. I you, I was not you know st- like starring in Emmy winning TV shows when I was 12. I'll tell you that much. But it's such a fun show. It is it a fun show. Yeah, they do a good job. Yeah, yeah. everyone's yeah. wonderful. So, yeah. Yes. Stranger Things. Watch it. It's, it's real. It, also, yeah. everyone's talking about it. You don't want to be the only person who doesn't get... I mean, even Sesame Street did a Stranger Things parody. You do not <laughs> want... With the Cookie Gorgon. Cookie Monsters, the Cookie Gorgon. Cookie Gorgon. Nice. Uh, so yeah, you definitely you definitely don't want to miss out. And I will say, I'll give a plug for the music, because the music yes. in every episode is fantastic. That's Aside from the creepy theme song, which is fantastic, yeah. but I mean, like, the, the background, like, the soundtrack, mm-hmm. I guess. Two Dolly Parton songs in season one. <laughs> 
yes. Yeah. You have your um, checklist of things checklist. that you heard Dolly Parton on. That's right. That's right. <laughs> she got Shazam on the entire time. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I thought it added a lot. As opposed to just being sort of like forgettable, you know, tones in the background. Yeah. Like they, they, it added a lot to the atmosphere and really brought up like the 80s aspect, if you will. Well, I actually freaked out because um, Mike's younger sister, Baby Holly, mm-hmm. uh, in the first season is wearing like a corduroy like overalls. And I like sat up on the couch and went, I had that outfit. That exact <laughs> outfit. There are pictures of me as a toddler in that outfit, and I was freaking out at how you know how realistic it was. That's the yeah. attention to detail. Oh yeah, yeah the costumes they do a great job. Yeah. Have you seen Stranger Things too? Yes. Yeah, okay. I've done both seasons. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the costumes like with the teenagers and just some of the things like there's the new characters, um, Billy and mm-hmm, Max. Matt, yeah. Um, but like the car and the and the jeans and oh my oh, god, Billy's hair. Oh. God. Billy and, wishes he had Steve's hair. His hair is so good. Yeah. It just keeps it getting just, bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah. He actually gives some hair tips. You find out how to so Dustin. Does yeah, mm-hmm. he gives Dustin some styling fan, tips. Fan, fan, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm the person friends. who hasn't watched it yet. I have a friend from college who um, <laughs> is in, in theater, and she and her husband uh, know Steve and are friends with Steve in real life. Uh, and awesome. she said his hair has always been that wonderful. Oh, my God. It's fantastic. It's always been that beautiful. It yeah. just gets bigger and bigger throughout it's the first season. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, she said, and she said, she said, IRL hair is that good. It's the star <laughs> of the show. It is, it is, it is, it is. Okay, we are totally off topic, but getting back. Okay, so you talked about getting off your sad book. Do you want to jump into your other sad book? Yeah, we can go ahead and get it out of the way. We get don't out have to way. We don't have to way. Yeah, we'll take a dip down and we'll come back up. With we don't have to end on a sad note. So I've talked about this in podcasts before. I'm pretty sure I'm still trying to sell Jenny on it. Um, <laughs> she she asked before we started, "Are you going to talk about your death book again?" And yes, I am. Um, it's called The Bright Hour by Nina Riggs. Um, it's it's beautiful. Um, if you've if you've heard of the book um, when when breath becomes air by Paul Kalanithi, um, it's kind of a similar book in that vein. Um, it is about um, Nina Riggs uh, is diagnosed with cancer um, at the same time that her mother has been diagnosed as cancer. So it's kind of them going through the process together. They're going through chemotherapy. Um, she is the mother of two two pretty young sons. They're like seven and nine, I think, um, in the book. Um, but she is such such a beautiful writer. Um, she's actually the something like third great granddaughter of Ralph Waldo Inter- blah, 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 Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, and it really shows in her writing, I think. She she has just some of the most beautiful prose. I kept um I read it um in ebook format on my phone, um, which is a super bad your habit. Phone like covered in tears. <laughs> it was to, like afterwards. wipe it off. Um yeah, a little bit. Um <laughs> I only cried at the end. Um, I kind of kept it together throughout the most of the book, even though I knew how it ended. Um, but I, I read it on my phone, and I kept taking screenshots of pages as I was reading, just because there were so many good passages, and she just has really lovely turns of phrases. Um, you can really tell when somebody writes um, a memoir or a novel that they that they also write poetry. I think it's really obvious because they they use such lyrical like prose and just turns of phrases and it's mm-hmm. it's just a beautiful book it's a really wonderful meditation on life and it's not a downer really I mean like it is in the sense that it, it's a cancer memoir it's it's <laughs> kind of inherently a downer but she she has such a wonderful sense of humor and she's got a really like wonderful outlook the entire book like she <laughs> there's one part when um the hospice nurse um comes to like check on her mother or something like that and she's just like oh, well, you've got kids. And she realizes that the hospice nurse thought that she was her mom because they were both going through chemotherapy. And then she was just like, no. Like, and I mean, it's just kind of like really like heartbreaking situations like that. But she comes out with such a, such a good sense of humor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's just a beautiful book. I, I really like... I really like memoirs like that. I loved When Breath Becomes Air, too. Um, there, there's lots of good cancer memoirs out there. If you like me and you like death books. As a genre, if you want to dive into the cancer memoirs, go Look, right Look, I'm just saying. On the other end of the spectrum. Best book I read. On the other end of the spectrum, my favorite nonfiction book of 2017 was This Is Just My Face, Try Not to Stare by Gabourey Sidibe. Um, if you're not familiar with her, she was the title uh, star in Precious, um, maybe Precious a couple years ago. I think she, she got an Oscar nomination for it, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Monique won, didn't she, for playing her mother? I believe so. I think so. Um, and she's also on the show Empire. She's a, a, a young woman, a young actress of color, um, and she is phenomenal. Her life story is fascinating. Um, her, she was a little bit older when um, her... I think probably, I think about like middle school, maybe, maybe even, maybe even a little younger than that when they discovered her dad was a polygamist. 
um, that he was actually married to several other women at the same time. Sure, like you do. She was working <laughs> for a uh, certain kind of telephone hotline, we'll adult say. Entertainment. Adult entertainment. Adult <laughs> entertainment when she got the role in Precious. Um, and she talks about really uh, how she kind of grew into herself and the confidence that comes from someplace very deep inside her. She's completely comfortable in who she is and what she stands for. Um, I highly recommend it. If you have mature, pretty you know, kind of mature teenage daughters, I think it's a great read for any teenage girl to read, especially a girl of color. It's just wonderful. She's she's delightful and she's so funny and witty and uh, but but her humor isn't even really self deprecating because she really loves herself and I just thought she was a great voice and I can't wait to see what else she does in the future. So also uh, on the funny end of the spectrum is We Are Never Meeting in Real Life by Samantha Irby, who has a great blog um, and a great Facebook uh, group also. Um, And she she had a hard knock life coming up. She's from Chicago, um, and she was a surprise baby, um, and she has um, siblings who are much older than her. Um, But her parents both died when she was like a late teenager, early young adult, um, and, and just sort of non- like it wasn't you know any big accident or anything it was just like they were old and worn out and hard lives and and so um she basically was taking care of herself from a fairly young age because they just they weren't really present for her um and so um she was really smart and she tried a semester of college but she was just really too disconnected from the whole process to she just didn't see any relevance in it and so um she just got on her own and started supporting herself and and um, she worked as the receptionist at an animal hospital and so <laughs> she has a lot of funny stories about working the desk there and people and their pets <laughs> I'm sure yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and she is just no holds barred she does not she's not what I would call an optimist she's a realist I'd say um, she talks about like, she's got a lot of um, chronic illnesses she's got like arthritis and I think like some um irritable bowel syndrome and some other things going on but but she talks about how her body hates her and she calls it her rotting meat suit and (laughs) (laughs) that'll just give you a a a small a small taste of like what what, what you can expect but she is hilarious and um she's super into um reality tv which I watch none of but I love reading about and hearing about other people, you know, and their experience watching it. Because yeah, I love to stuff. read Bachelor recaps. Like, <laughs> I don't watch The Bachelor. I yeah, think it's yeah. a horrible, uh, like, reflection on society. But I will <laughs> read any of the recaps you yeah. want to put online. Yeah. I'm the same way. Same with the Kardashians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I like knowing about these people, like, as mm-hmm. sort of characters in the world. You know? mm-hmm. And so she writes about, like, just her TV addiction and, um, you know, trying to find comfortable shoes and, um, you know, taking her bra off and how she's, like, her, the, the name, like I said, we're never meeting in real life. That, that comes from her book club and her blog because she's like, I don't want to go to your house. I don't want to have to pretend that, you know, um, I care about you. I don't want to have to sit here with, you know, a glass of wine. And she's an introvert, basically. She's an introvert, and she's just like, yeah, I love books, and I'm not going to come to your house. Like, we can be friends, and I'm never going to see you in real life. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just a collection of stories um, just kind of all over the place from different times in her life, and it's just fantastic, just deeply, deeply funny. Um, and it's it's exactly what this this year needed, yeah. um, and the cover's great. Too. I also really loved um, also what this year needed. Theft by Finding by David Sedaris. Mm-hmm. Um, he is my favorite author of all time. I he doesn't know this, but I've decided he's an honorary uncle of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I call Wouldn't him Uncle he David. Yeah. Um, he has kept a journal slash diary from a very young age, and so this is just it's going to be a two volume set. This is just the first. Oh collection of his diaries and it starts when he's young and like fresh out of school and doesn't know what he wants to do with his life and it goes all the way up until right about the time uh, I think Santa Land Diaries comes out which was kind of his big break mm-hmm. um, but it's it's fantastic and it it's it's funny and it's hilarious to to you know have him kind of if you've read his stories and you know the characters you know so there's like where he meets Hugh who's his partner and is in a lot of his books there's um his sister Amy uh, who is very funny in her own right as a comedian. Um, she gets booked on like something, like a television show, and he's he's incredibly excited for her, and he's got all these notes in his journal about how thrilled he is for Amy and what a big deal it is for his family. And um, So it's really sweet to go back and see, kind of, you're sort of reading it as it's happening, kind of real time. Mm-hmm. So you can get kind of the basis for some of his uh, stories that would you know, get end up in his books later on, but I highly recommend it. I, just I will it. confess, I started it um, in print, and it is a doorstop of a book. It's it huge. It's literally like yeah. years of his diaries. Um, 
and I couldn't just I couldn't keep up with just sort of like the minutia. However, it all of a sudden occurred to me while you're talking. You said it's a two volume set. This would be the perfect kind of thing to have on audio and just sort oh, of like yeah. let play on a road trip or yeah. just little pieces here and there. Like because he reads all of his books, which right? Is and his even voice better. is so funny and like just the inf- his inflections. Because if if you have ever heard him talk, I've seen him in person several times. Mm-hmm. Like when I read his stuff, now I can hear him. Yes. And it just it adds that much more to it. And so I think this would be the perfect thing on audio. And it would be just, great. Just listen to it little by little, like literally in his voice. To this day I cannot listen to Billy Holiday because I hear him singing <laughs> as Billy Holiday. So it just it just morphs into David Sedaris singing at Billy Holiday. Yeah. But yeah, he's delightful. I saw him when he came to Lexington a couple years ago and he signed my book, Dear Jenny, Let's Enjoy Life with Missy's Pies. Mm. My friend brought her Kindle because she said, you know, all my all your books are on my Kindle. I want you to sign my Kindle. So he signed it, Dear Amy, it's no iPad. Love David Sedaris. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> yeah. It's true, but it was just, it was hilarious. Yeah. Just so funny. He looked at it and he was like, I'll sign it. Why don't you have an iPad? <laughs> I love my iPad. That's mm-hmm. pretty funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, if we're going to throw out plugs for our favorite authors, I just want to, I don't have much to say about it, but Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman came out this year. Um, like David Sedaris, he tends to read most of his books on audiobook. Um, he doesn't do the really long ones. I think he got somebody else to read American Gods. <laughs> um, I don't know that he necessarily wanted to read that. I still never made it all the way through American Gods. Oh, it's I know. Oh, my God. You should read it. Everybody should read everything by Neil Gaiman. (laughs) It's phenomenal. He's your David Sedaris. He's my David Sedaris. (laughs) He's my uncle. He's my Uncle Neil. I love him so much. (laughs) Cried when I saw him in person. It was really ugly. When did you see him in person? um, He came to Lexington a few years ago whenever he was touring with Fortunately the Milk. I remember that. It was his last signing tour that he did. Mm. Fun fact. And it was terrible because he was in um, this place that was right next to a bar and this horrible band was playing the whole time that he was doing a reading and so you couldn't hear him and he was really mad and I was like he's never coming back to Lexington ever yeah he won't come back to Lexington probably because that was really terrible yeah um but he was really really wonderful he was so sweet I um I actually have an an email I wrote Neil Gaiman an email when I was 16 years old and he responded to me literally like two days later (gasps) And wow. I printed out a copy of my email and his response, and I have, like, that same sheet of paper that I printed out at my parents' house when I was, like, 16 years old. You and he, frame si- it. he signed it for me, and I framed it. It's framed oh, now. Okay. <laughs> it has that a signature good. on it. That's a good deal. Um, it's, he's really, really wonderful. Norse mythology came out. Um, it's literally just Neil Gaiman's retellings of all of the Norse creation myths. They're really delightful. He connects with his fans on a level. He's like the Lin-Manuel Miranda of, <laughs> of, of authors. And the way that so he much. loves his fans, it connects with his fans. He tweeted at me a few times. Really exciting every single time it happens. <laughs> like I, any sort of connection that I can have with him, I'm just like, oh my god, he he acknowledged me for a second, he thought about me for those two seconds that he tweeted. That's awesome. Good for me. Um, so everybody should listen to Norse Mythology. He reads the audiobooks. Um, I mean, it's Neil Gaiman reading you Norse myths. It's really well, fun. Not yeah, he's he's got a wonderful reading voice. Um, I would recommend his audiobooks to anybody. I will say um, I really enjoyed the series. Yeah. So... I'm um, looking forward to season two of that. Yes, American Gods, um, the the show on Stars is really really wonderful. I'm hoping that I will get it on DVD for Christmas so that I can rewatch it. Oh, um, who's in that? Um, Everybody. Yeah, Ian McShane is Mr. Wednesday, and he's phenomenal. Yeah. He's so good. Um, Orlando, Orlando Jones. Orlando oh Jones God. is a Nancy. Oh, and it's incredible. He has one of the most incredible monologues. The one on the slave ship. Boom! I was like, I am so. I saw it as yeah. a clip. I was like, I guess I have to watch the show. I I do love Orlando Jones. He's he wonderful. Knocked it out. Yeah. of the park. Knocked it out of the park. If you, everybody should read American Gods first because the show diverts a lot. Um, the show is not on the same page necessarily as the book. They're kind of taking some liberties. Yeah. Um, so I would recommend reading the book first. Um, but would, the I show would, is really good. Yeah, I would like you wouldn't necessarily have to. I would just because there's a lot there. There's yeah. it's so detailed and so layered. You'll understand the show better if you read the book. First. I absolutely believe that to be yeah. true. Um, and the show is like visually is just stunning. Like they do just such a great job. Oh, it's job. beautiful. Weird. This is really the golden age of television. Like. In terms of you know like actors and and the performances and like what they can do and Brian like, Fuller's not coming back for season two though did you hear what Brian no, Fuller's what? leaving yeah what what else does he have to do what is he doing I don't know they didn't pay him enough and he got mad and left yeah I know well, he Brian Fuller is a big reason why the first season was so beautiful because he is the person who did Hannibal he did Pushing Daisies he does really beautiful work um, but yeah he's he pieced out so we're getting someone new for season two but hopefully Neil Gaiman will still be there he will yeah. still be helping um, so so hopefully he tracks. will yeah. Um, yeah. But 
It's a wonderful show. Really, yeah. really good. It is good. Very beautiful. Um, you guys were just talking about turtles all the way down. Um, so uh, I'll give a plug for The Unlikely Hero of Room 13B, if you haven't read that. Um, it, it came out a couple of years ago. It's by Teresa Totten. It is a, a YA. Um, and it is a fantastic portrayal of anxiety and OCD in teenagers. It's a boy who, who is part of a support group for kids. Um, and... and um, it, it's just him, like, kind of trying to get through life, and his mom has some issues that she's not addressing, and he's wondering, like, what to do about it. Like, you know, you know, he's he's I think he's supposed to be like, I don't know, fourteen, fifteen, somewhere in there. Um, but I thought it was a fantastic portrayal of. It really brought home like what it must be like to live with that, um, like the anxiety. I thought it did a really good job. And it, and it's sort of one of those things where it's like they always say, like, show, don't tell, mm-hmm. you know, for an author. Um, and I thought that was the perfect, um, the author did a fantastic job of doing that because you didn't feel like somebody was lecturing you about, like, how this was. She was showing it, you know, with his thoughts and what he was doing. And he was, like, legit trying to use his, you know, therapeutic techniques to sort of, you know, keep himself together. Um, and, you know, then, like I said, he's got this, group of kids that also have issues um and you know trying to sort of navigate normal teenage stuff along with these challenges that are you know very real in his life um but uh so that's a great one also um but i read something it was called borderline by michelle baker it's part of a a series called the arcadia project and the protagonist is a woman a young woman who um has borderline personality disorder and she tried to kill herself um by jumping off of a building at UCLA and ends up with two amputated legs. Um, and so she checks herself into rehab afterward, um, both for her mental issues and her physical re- recuperation. Um, and, you know, so there's there's a whole, like, uh, paranormal um, mystery kind of set up, and, you know, she becomes sort of a um, paranormal cop, if you will. Um, and so that story aside, which is actually really fun for, like, the urban fantasy side of it, the portrayal of... Um, borderline personality um like from the first person it's really fascinating um so like she's got double challenges she's got the borderline thing and then she then it talks you know it's showing how she's trying to get around with her prosthesis and like um one is above the knee and one is below the knee and you know so she talks about like you know how she has to take them off and she can't take a um, a shower in the morning and then put her prosthesis on because if there's any moisture like then there's a bunch of irritation she can't do that and she talks about how much they hurt and um just you know um, stairs are her enemy and just like all of the, the challenges of like getting around um, and what it's going to mean and how she like has to plan out her day and her movements to go along with this while she's fighting you know like evil forces and and you know um, rogue fairies and whatnot <laughs> um, and uh, so at any rate so like I said she's, she's meeting all these new people and like how you know a lot of the well all of the people in the Arcadia project are um <laughs> They're all people who suffer from some serious um, mental health issues and or have backgrounds that really compromise them. Um, And at one point she brings it up to her handler and says, is that why you chose all of us? So that if we went and told, like, say, the wider world about, like, the the fact that there are really fairies and there are these portals into a different world, nobody would believe us because we don't have any credibility. And they're all like, "Eh, yeah, (laughs) pretty much. Um, But so it's like her trying to control, like, her rage and her self-loathing and um, her manipulation and you know so she talks about like the um, the things that that you know the characteristics of her disorder and like how she tries to kind of talk herself out of it and and use her therapeutic techniques um, and I thought it was really interesting because you know there are a lot of urban fantasy series um, but this one was. Um, I thought it was just a little bit out of the ordinary in that, you know, showing this person like dealing with physical challenges, but also uh, mental health issues um, and trying to sort of stay on track. Um, and you know, from like I said, from a first person perspective, that was really interesting. Yeah, that's but, really different. Mm-hmm. That's, that's not something that you get that often. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's that's the thing, too. It's like I've yeah. read a lot of like I said, urban fantasy and sci fi and different kinds of things. And, you know, sometimes there are, like, you know, there's a few protagonists who are like depressed or, you know, like the teenagers, like there's some anxiety things, you know. But I mean, in general, there's not a whole lot of it. And this is one of the only ones that I can think of where the where the person is, you know, um, a diagnosed borderline 
person mm -hmm. as opposed, you know, there's some bipolar um, I've seen, um, but this one looks at, um, and it was really interesting because and the author either has firsthand knowledge or she knows somebody who has this because, look, the things that she's talking about, it's like, oh my gosh, she's talking about um, self-loathing and how people go, oh, I hate myself. And she's like, no, you don't know what that really means. Yeah. Like to literally hate yourself and like the depths that, of despair that you fall into with the self-loathing and what you will do to get out of it. Um, and she talks about, you know, she's like, you know, like these bursts of rage that she has and sometimes she controls it and sometimes she doesn't and then she kind of has to live with the consequences. Um, and so it's very interesting. Mm. But that, it's a great series. Nice. Um, and if it's not too obvious, I think we have to give a plug to The Hate You Give. Oh, absolutely. By Angie Carter. Yes. Um, it's on everybody's best list and I mean, it came out in February and it's still going strong. And it won two movie. awards on Goodreads end of your list. <laughs> no, it literally no. won two of them. I was like, well, all right. <laughs> Every category. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, Easily one of the best books of the year, and for, you know, I mean, decade, maybe? I don't know. Um, there are movies already in the works, and I'm really yeah. interested to see what else Angie Carter ends up doing. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't already read it, yeah. you need to grab it. And if you're not familiar, it is a story of a, um, a black girl who's in the car with her with a friend of hers, a black boy, and he is shot by the police in front of her, right? Mm -hmm. Am I correct? She's in the yeah, car with the him. Witness, yeah. Yeah. She's the witness, and it's the, the aftermath of that, mm -hmm. and um, it's just beautifully done, and even just flipping through it, I mean, the dialogue is... is spot on to the way that, you know, teenagers talk. Um, the family, which I think the is some, family, which I her think family is hard so to do. Yes, um, for teenagers. But the family, to me, is what got me. Yeah. Like, when I closed the book, I was astounded how a book that's really not that long, I mean, it's not nothing, but it's not it's not huge, um, at how much you felt like you knew the family. Mm -hmm. The mom, the dad, the store, you know, the brother, you know, the older brother with the, with the other mom. Like, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, since we did touch briefly on Stranger Things, um, if you are planning on doing some binge watching over this holiday season, um, if you are into The Crown, which I am here for anything that Matt Smith is in. Uh, and he Can we go ahead and book, book, book the, the Ferris Theater to watch the new royal wedding? Oh my gosh, we should. That would be You're a really good about program. It. <laughs> I, I highly recommend Victoria the Queen by Julia Baird. Um, if you liked Victoria or you liked The Crown, it's just a, another great look. Production values. Oh. Royal Life. Oh, The Crown is phenomenal. Oh, my God. I mean, God. it's Netflix's most expensive show, I think. Yeah. That <laughs> you would can surprise tell. Me. It is beautiful. I know. Yeah. <sighs> um, also, if you are super into Stranger Things, as we mentioned, uh, Stephen King's It, I feel like goes without <laughs> saying, both because uh, Mike from Stranger Things is in the movie It, um, and also because in season two there's a story about a clown that Sean Astin tells, and uh, <laughs> sort, of a, sort of a parallel to, to It. Um, also, Clive Barker's The Hellbound Heart. Um, which I have not read because it's too scary. But if you like Stranger Things, you might enjoy. Um, meddling Kids would be another good one. Mm -hmm. Meddling Kids would be yeah, great. That's yeah. been on a few lists so It's sort far. of like a grown-up Scooby-Doo. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, which is really fun. And then one list I found, I thought this was actually really hilarious. Um, they listed the Choose Your Own Adventure book, Underground Kingdom. Uh, they said was was great if you were really into Stranger Things. All right. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, we have to talk about The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue. Yes, because we're still trying to convince Jenny to read it. Yes. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's it's YA, but it's delightful. Um, it is a historical romance, I yes. guess, really, but even though it's YA. Um, and it is the story um, of a young man. He's aristocratic uh, um, heir, um, and he's... <laughs> A ne'er do well, I guess we'll say. Yeah, that's a really um, good term for he gets, it. He gets up to a lot of hijinks, and he's sort of a, a disgrace. And um, there's like gambling, and basically he's a partier. Yeah, he's a partier. He, he's the Paris Hilton of his age, and he's he's um, embarrassed the family. And um, he is he is gay, and um, like his dad knows, and his sister knows, and um, like pretty so much he, everybody knows. Everybody, everybody <laughs> knows without knowing because you know it is still it's supposed to. What is, I think they it's a. 17th century or 18th century? I think it's 17th century. Or like 18th or 19th. Yeah, I, I, I don't know somewhere I around there. If they give the actual year, but I mean, it's supposed to be like it would be late 18th, early. He's gonna go on his grand century. tour. Yeah, yeah. As as young rich men uh, are wont to do, um, and he's supposed to be escorting his sister to finishing school in Switzerland, right. and he is taking his biracial friend with him as as sort of his companion um but his dad is mad at him and um he's disgraced him for the last time and so he says that um 
he 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 hires them a guardian, yeah, um, who basically is going to keep the kibosh on any actual fun, <laughs> yes. And so like they're supposed to be going to museums and lectures and and all these uh, improving things as opposed to the music halls and um, balls and parties that they had planned on, um, and so he has. Um, uh, What's the protagonist's name? Monty. Monty, yes. yes. Um, he's desperately in love with this friend um, of his and... Percy. Uh, Percy. Yes. But he doesn't know if Percy returns his feelings, and he, he doesn't want to rock the boat by telling him. And so, you know, he just sort of has to stifle himself. And so, um, off they go. Yeah. <laughs> off they go. Obviously, they get rid of the, the companion pretty quick. Right. Like, in true romance novel <laughs> form, like, things go off the rails, like, real <laughs> real soon. I remember, yeah. I, I read it first, and then Becca read it after me, and uh, you, you came out over to me like after the part where Monty ends up naked at a party <laughs> and you're just like oh all right <laughs> like okay that's like, where this book is going it's like yep, yep sure. it, it goes off the rails real quick yeah um it's just delightful <laughs> it's so much fun it's a big break of a book like it's, it's a romp but it yeah. goes really fast it does it's a quick read and even it's, though it's long it's funny even though they get into trouble and so like it's him and his sister and the friend um just careening across France, they, they've lost all of their luggage and all of their money, yeah. and they ditched the, the the chaperone. And they're trying to make their they're trying to make their way to is it Nice or Marseille? I forget where they're trying to get to. Yeah, somewhere um, around there. It's like Monty steals a key at one point. Right, there's well, a whole deal with a key. <laughs> well, they they're they're trying to get there because that's where they're supposed to rendezvous, and that and um, their father he has a bank account there, and they're mm-hmm. thinking that if they can get there, they can get. Some money, because so they're having to survive on their wits, mm-hmm. um, and that's really funny because and it's um, hard because Percy's because biracial and they've got a woman with them, right. and chaperone also. <laughs> and Monty has always been rich and always had everything, and so he's not used to doing without. And so he's very clever and he's very charming and good looking, and so that helps them all along yeah. the way. He does some flirting, right? <laughs> um, but it's but it's his. Um, uh, journey, uh, waking up to the realities of life mm-hmm. without money, what, you know, the challenges that women might face and that his biracial friend might face. Um, and it is hilarious and super fun. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. There's going to be a sequel. Yeah. Um, following the sister, sister which is really mm-hmm. exciting. Yeah. Um, it's delightful. Mackenzie Lee, I don't know. I think that if this isn't her debut novel, I think it's one of her, her, earlier ones. I don't know that she's written that much. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is wonderful. Um, it is such a fun read. Yeah. Um, it was really, really, really sweet. For sure. Well, I'm going to jump in real fast since that was a way I book and take it down a couple a couple grade levels. Sure. And go with favorite picture books of 2017. I got a couple. Uh, just because I read a lot of that uh, at home. Uh, so my favorite this year, my favorite was After the Fall uh, by Dan Sinat, I think is how you say his name. Mm-hmm. But he's the same guy who did um, The Adventures of Beagle. Which might be one of my favorite books of all time. And one of the Caldecott. There you go. Uh, it, beagle. Not Beagle. Oh. oh. <laughs> Jenny's wearing, wearing a Beagle I'm wearing shirt. a sweater with a Beagle on it. And, uh, I like the idea beagle. of the age of beagles. So. Yeah. Right? Uh, no, it's... It, but the, after the fall is the story of Humpty Dumpty after he falls. Mm. And getting the courage to get back up again on that wall and uh, go bird watching, which is his favorite hobby. It's delightful. <laughs> and actually, I feel like the message is, is maybe even more appropriate for grown-ups. I read it and I was like, man, this is really profound. My three-year-old was like, next! Yeah. On the next story. <laughs> um, Dragons Love Tacos 2 came out this year, which is the sequel to Dragons Love Tacos. That's exciting. Sure. Another fantastic read. Another great sequel, Mighty Mighty Construction Site, which was the sequel to Good Night, Good Night Construction Site. <laughs> also a big hit at my house. Um, the Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is fantastic and uh, delightful. Uh, not quite Narwhal, uh, about a unicorn who wants to be a narwhal. And uh, Spunky Little Monkey by Bill Martin Jr., which you can kind of do as a song, and it's really fun and cute. Cute. Yeah, that's my list. I just want to throw out there Triangle by John Classen. Oh, yeah. That was a really... John Classen... <laughs> I don't have children. I just read picture books, um, yeah. as one does. I really like John Classen. Um, his artwork is amazing. He is the person of This Is Not My Hat fame. Um, he did all the Hat Trilogy, which okay. is really, really funny. Um, but Triangle came out this year, and it's hilarious, as all John Classen picture books are. It's about a triangle who plays a prank on his friend, The Square. Um, <laughs> it's will, really cute. I will also throw out, if you like Dragons Love Tacos and Secret Pizza Party and all the books that, that those guys do if you can track them down some of their earlier books were, co- were called uh, those darn squirrels and then there's those darn squirrels fly south and those darn squirrels and the cat next door um, it's a see it's a it's a three series but uh, three picture book series the library does not have them they're pretty old and they're like only in paperback um, mm. but they are so hilarious and my three-year-old talks about them all the time the protagonist is a very grumpy old man named old man fukuire 
uh, and the squirrels that live in his uh, outside his house that he cannot stand. Um, and the squirrels are hilarious, and Old Man Fuquire is very grumpy. And uh, Fuquire, that's a really interesting it's name. It's really <laughs> fun. It's fun. It's really fun. He gets a neighbor in one of them. Her name is um, Old Lady Hugh, and she is a, a pie baker. But uh, they're just really fun, and uh, my son constantly, when he's in a bad mood, he's like, I just feel like old man Fuquire today. <laughs> so I highly recommend if you can get your hands on The power of literature. That's it's really true. cute. Amazon has it, yeah. if nothing else. Aw, so. that's a really good one. <laughs> uh, do we want to talk about book tracking? Absolutely. Yeah, just throwing it out there. If you're wondering how we keep track of all of these books, um, I, I know I personally looked back at my... Uh, I read like 97 books this year, I think, and I looked back at my list and I was like, wow, was that this year? Because it seems like so long ago now. Um, but I personally keep track of all of my reading on Goodreads. Um, I, I use it as a tool constantly in the library. If somebody asks me what I have read recently and I immediately go blank because that's what I do when I get asked and that the, question and usually. the Lexington Public Library has a Goodreads group, do we not? Yes. Yes, yes we, we do. Have, we have a Goodreads group that you can join and you can kind of see what people are mm-hmm. reading and, and whatnot. Yes, um, but you can log books as you read them. You can look them up by ISBN if you want to be really specific and make sure you have the correct um, edition that you are reading. Um, you can log uh, the amount that you're reading as you go through. When you say you're finished, you can then rate it and you can add it to different shelves in your Goodreads account. Um, I typically keep a shelf for the year that I'm reading and then like romance or YA or whatever different categories. Um, I know a lot of people keep like a did not finish shelf. If like they they tried to finish one, didn't quite make it, you can shelve it there. Um, but yeah, no, it's a great it's a great tool. It's free. It's linked to Facebook. Um, I think it's owned by the same people who own Facebook. It's um, owned by Amazon. Oh, it's owned by Amazon. Mm-hmm. I don't. I can't keep track of who owns yeah, what I mean, anymore. If you, honestly, if you buy a lot from Amazon, you can automatically put it on your. If you buy something, you could automatically add it to one of your Goodreads yes. uh, list. I just assume that Disney owns everything at this point, <laughs> and I just go with it. <laughs> what's the difference? Yeah, for, for the average person, yeah, what's, what's the difference? You know, um, I have a Goodreads account, and I do mostly keep up with it for certain categories of books, um, and, and that's mostly in an attempt to be social and interact mm-hmm. with um, people that I know. There's a good social aspect to go. You can like like and comment on what you're right, reading. And you can see what, what people are, are putting up mm-hmm. in terms of the, what they're reading. So um, there, there is something to be said for that. Um, but my main tracker is a website called Library Thing librarything.com and it's been around for for over a decade and I really love it and um, in terms of having like an actual catalog I think it's a little more um, robust Goodreads is great for just tracking um, the reason I like good uh, library thing is that if I'm looking you know you can tag all your stuff um, and they have lots of stats and lots of um, ways to sort your books so you can sort by rating you can sort by date you can sort by title author etc um and so I use that as my main catalog. And so I use that actually a lot in my library work, too, because when people ask for a horror book or books about mm-hmm. Ireland or I don't know, whatever, like, depending on how well I've tagged them. Yeah, books, you can find it. I go back and find those and, and see how I rated things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, like I've been using it for over well, 11 years, I guess. And so I've got about 2,600 books cataloged, a little over. Um and a lot of it, it like it is a really um, uh, good way to keep track of what you're reading, your development, if you will, um, and see. Um, I, one of the things is that that has changed for me over time since I started it was that I used to read a lot of older books, a lot of classics, of course. You know that was college time and high school time, um, and how much current stuff I read now, because um, uh, it will show you like the you know the relative age of the things that you're reading. Um, and that is just sort of a factor of the job is trying to keep up with yeah. everything that's coming out. Yeah. So I read um, so much yeah. more popular stuff now than I did before yeah. I worked in a library. Yeah, I tried to broaden my reading a lot. Um, and so that is my... You can also keep track of your reading in the library catalog, um, which is, I think, something not a lot of people know about. They more should know about it. Um, in your library account, you can rate the items that you've read, and you can keep track of what you've read there. Um and that's handy dandy if you want everything in one place and you mm-hmm. don't want a separate site and you don't want a separate password and a separate um, username and, and all that stuff and you don't want to pay anything or you know um, get sucked up into the Amazon vortex like um, just you can just do it within the catalog mm-hmm. um, and so you know same thing you can tag things and you can um, you can rate them right there and it's really easy when you're looking through the library catalog, looking for something new to read. If you've forgotten that you already read something, which has happened to me before, yep, um, yep, you yep, can I've see. <laughs> so yeah, I, 
lots of mystery readers have this problem where you you pick up a book and you're like, have I read this? Seems because familiar. after a while, the plots start to kind of run together, and it's not until you romance. get to the end, and you're like, oh, I remember who did that. Yeah, I've done that before. Yeah, I've done it with romances before, too. <laughs> I'm feeling that this is very familiar all of a sudden. Yeah, I, it's like, a I think a I've been genre, in the same situation. Genre readers have fallen into that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys. I feel like I've I've been taking notes this whole time and adding things to my Goodreads list. Actually, as you guys have been talking, so I've got I've got a long list of things to jump into. I'm really excited. I'm gonna pick up some Amy Stewart finally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm you gonna should. do it. Yeah, I think you, you'll like it. Yeah, we probably have it here on the shelf. I'm sure we do. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. thanks everybody so. for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks so much for joining us, Becca. Thanks. <laughs>